So um, the first question is actually a continuation of the um, the topic we had last week. Um, the question is: Are there places where the chakra energy and the meridian energies connect or mix? What is the role of such places? And are the energies of the chakra and meridian separated? And if they are separated, why and how? Um, it's, it's, they are very separate energies. Um, the big difference is that uh, through the meridians flows life force. And life force also means that uh, it has to be uh, connected to a physical being, a physical body. Um, while chakras are basically uh, parts of the personality structure. So a uh, spirit has chakras, but a spirit does not have meridians. So that's really the essential difference. Um, but in the same way you can, you can see a spirit which has a lot of chakras and structures. Uh, it has in a way to, um, to compress itself, to lose all its structure in the process of incarnation. Um, so in a way the, uh, the whole structure of the spirit is transformed into a blueprint which is then incarnated into the body and then it is built up again. So the spirit does not simply enter into the physical body with all its chakras uh, because then there would indeed be no interaction between chakras and meridians. It would just be uh, the, the spirit and its vibration, its energy body has chakras and the physical bodies has meridians. Um, but uh, in our process of incarnation, we do uh, mingle the two together. And basically the, the life force, um, which, uh, which flows through the meridians, helps us to build up these chakras. So what you often see is that when a person uh, is sick or tired or has in some other way uh, a decreased life force, then also the chakras will, yeah, will weaken or will tilt a little bit or uh, just become smaller. Um, so there's a, a, a very strong relationship to that. Uh, one of the other things you also see is in the position of the chakras. So when a person has a lot of life force, then the, uh, the chakras on the foresight tend to be uh, bigger because the person is in a way projecting their energy outward. And when a person is tired, the chakras tend to be bigger on the, on, the, uh, on the rear because the chakras are absorbing energies and feeding the, uh, the energy body. So the chakras are uh, really cooperating with the meridian system. Also, to, uh, when a person is strong, to manifest that strength. And when the person is weak or tired, um, so that the person takes in a way a step back and start recharging themselves from the energy which is available uh, in the area. So the chakras in a living being and the chakras in a spirit, they are quite different. Um, they have the same function. They are uh, parts of the energy body which allow you to interchange energies with your environment. But the type of energies which flow through them are very different if you only have a spirit body or if you also have a physical body. And this in a way uh, necessitates the, the reformation of the chakras because they need to be able to work with heavier energies, lower energies, um, for, uh, to interact with the physical world and also to interact with the, with the physical body and to um, express themselves. So. Um, you often are also more in tune with the chakras of other living beings and their vibration than with the chakras of uh, uh, purely spiritual beings. So you can feel the mood or the love or the thoughts of a purely spiritual being, but it's generally easier to do that with a, with a living being. Um, there is, of course, the one restriction, which is actually the same as with food. The more pure the vibration, uh, the easier it is to digest. Um, so the emotions and the thoughts and the impressions you get from other spirits 
um, they're very easy to digest. They really flow into your consciousness and out of your consciousness quite easily. Um, while the vibrations you pick up from other incarnated beings, they tend to be heavier, stronger. Uh, so just like eating meat, it is, takes a lot more time to digest them, to get rid of them, to flush them out of your system. So the, the spiritual impulses, they are more dreamlike, if you will. Um, so the, um, the chakras have the, the kind of the prana tube through which the energies flow. Uh, and the, en the energies flow up from the earth and down from, uh, from the heavens. And both these upward flow and this downward flow, um, they connect in the pranic tube. And uh, it is basically through our digestion chakras um, and the lung chakras uh, that we pick up energy from our environment, but also directly through our, our normal chakras. And these energies from the environment, they go into our uh, meridian system. So by smelling nice food or drinking it or eating it, uh, or by being in an environment which has a, a nourishing vibration, uh, your life force will start replenishing itself. Uh, in general, to, uh, to increase your life force, it is very good to be near flowing water. Uh, because it's especially the water spirits and water energies which carry a lot of life force more than all the other elements. Um, this is also reflected in that the, the second chakra, which is about your desires, your emotions, also generates the largest amount of life force. Uh, so it's basically by being passionate, uh, your life force becomes strong. Um, you find the same stories, of course, in uh, people who have lost their purpose in life, who have lost their will to live, they grow old and sick very quickly. While people who are taking care of a dog or their grandchildren, they tend to remain healthy and um, cogent a lot longer and better. Um, so the energies are indeed uh, um, separated and um, basically um, most of the of the life force we have in our meridians is basically the life force we absorb from other living beings. Um, so we can do that by being in our proximity, by touching them, by petting them, by cuddling them, by having sex with them, uh, by eating them, by smelling them. Um, so these are basically um, the ways in which our energy body is, is replenished. So living in nature or with animals, they also tend to help to build up a stronger physical body, a stronger life force. Um, also, uh, youth is, uh, is very important uh, because youth is often uh, connected a lot with emotion and passion, uh, which tends to decrease, and curiosity also, which tend to decrease as people get older, uh, because more and more blockages uh, start to occur and more and more satisf satisf uh, satisfaction also occurs. So the desires decrease, and also people become very blocked by their merit, by their um, uh, by their thought patterns, uh, by their traumas, uh, by their habits, and all these things uh, decrease our uh, curiosity and our life force. And a relatively small part of the uh, of the life force is directly absorbed from uh, from the surroundings, from non-living things. Uh, but it's also important because these uh, non-living energies which we uh, pick up, they really balance our elements. So the, the, the earth, the water, the air and the fire in us. And that basically sets a certain mood. Um, so while it might be very healthy to uh, live next to the river, um, depending on your character, you might do a lot better in a desert or in a forest or in a swamp. Uh, because of the different elemental energies which are there, which can also correspond, uh, but then more to the, to the spirit energy body, not just the physical energy body. Um, and also the um, influences from all the different uh, planets. Uh, they're also a major influence on our, our, our character, our personality, our moods, our energies, 
Um, so although most of our life energy comes from living sources, you cannot wholly discount the non-living sources because they form more of a, of a framework for the living energies. The living energies are flowing, are moving, are also used up and uh, the others are more like a, a steady program or a steady structure which is guiding the, the life force. And all these energies are picked up through our, uh, through our chakras. And if a certain chakra is closed, you start to lack that uh, specific vibration. And that's part of your, uh, your personality and also the uh, part of the energy body which is related to that will start to wither. So uh, I'll move on to a different topic now. Um, if I could comment on time in different spheres of consciousness, how does this impact our spiritual development? Well, that's a very tricky question and it depends very much on perspective. Mm. So uh, time is, is mentioned uh, a lot in the, in the Vedic literature. Um, where they actually have different time scales like how long is one day for a god, how long is one day for a demigod, how long is one day for uh, a demon, how long is one day for uh, uh, yeah, a human and um, there you can compare the time scales and in general what you uh, see in the system is that the time scales of, uh, of greater beings, gods and demigods, are bigger than humans. So, um, like thousands of days of, of a human would equal one day for, of a demigod. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about that because it's not really interpreted uh, very clearly in the, in the original Vedic text, as far as I know. I haven't studied the Vedas extensively, I have to admit. Um, one of the ideas I, ha I heard mentioned uh, is that time is about um, uh, amount of transformation. So for a human being, um, from one day to the next or one, from one year to another, there will be a lot of changes. They may have a different job, their health may have changed, uh, their relationship may have changed. Uh, pe new people might have entered into their life or may have disappeared from their lives, they might have been born, they might have died. So the uh, structure of the life, of the existence, has altered a lot. And um, in the same way for a god or a demigod, um, what these small changes uh, which occur on a day-to-day -day or on a year-to-year -year level, they don't really amount to anything because they relate to uh, bigger things, the, the race of a, of a people or of a nation or um, even of the entire planet or the, or the entire solar system. Um, so for a significant change to happen within a solar system, for instance for a planet to be destroyed or to be caught or um, a moon to, to, uh, to leave its orbit, um, these things don't happen that quite that frequently. Um, so for them to have a significant change uh, tends to take longer. So this is one of the interpretations of, uh, of time scales because they just work on a, on a larger scale. Um, another uh, way of looking at it is that uh, because of their increased consciousness um, they can deal with a lot more changes and uh, therefore for them to be challenged enough so that their consciousness will alter or will grow requires a lot more stimulation. Um, so for, in comparison, uh, for me as, a, as an adult human uh, to learn how to use a new type of calculator well, it might take me an hour, it might take me two hours, and then I can do it. But if, for instance, a monkey has to try to learn how to use a calculator, let alone a different type of calculator, it might spend months trying to, to learn it, to figure it out. And in the same way it is theorized that these higher beings have uh, such yeah, bigger consciousness 
able of solving much more problems that um, yeah for it to learn uh, something new it requires a, a lot more um, uh, stimulation um, and uh, so even though a god or a goddess will be helping thousands of peoples at the same time or keeping checks of millions of processes at the same time their capacity is so much larger that uh, an enormous amount of these processes have to take place for the, uh, the god or the goddess itself to really grow, to really alter. Um, so these are also uh, systems of time scale. Um, what is noticed by humans who go on these uh, different spheres of, uh, of time is usually that um, time becomes very non-linear. Um, sometimes people have the feeling that they've spent like a lifetime in a different sphere and when they come back they find out only minutes have passed or the opposite way around that only minutes have passed in their experience on this other time sphere and when they come back they notice they've been meditating for hours and hours um, so what is very clear from human experience is that our experience of time is not very linear when it comes to these travels. And if we look at our um, registration of time, it's rather paradoxical. So when things are happening, then our brains are busy dealing with all the changes and time or the passage of time is not registered. And when uh, the brain is basically idle, it has no stimulation, then it starts looking for stimulation, it starts looking for something to do and then it will start keeping track of time. Um, so our biological clock itself is very um, awkward, very inaccurate when it comes to very linear time. And it gives a rather uh, paradoxical uh, or opposite account of what has happened since it doesn't register change but it rather registers the lack of change. Um, what my own experiences are in, um, in going to other dimensions is that basically the, uh, the transferal of information is usually quite swift, uh, quite direct. Uh, you look at something and you know what it is or uh, some being shows you something and you uh, in a glance pick up the entire essence or the entire history of it but since our brains are linear uh, we cannot process it we cannot comprehend it uh, in the way it is handed to us so our brain starts a transformation process in like slowly unpackaging this this whole lump uh, which was given to it and then slowly but surely dissecting it and experiencing it in a linear manner and this linear manner can take days even uh, for for you to digest uh, uh, something which you've glimpsed in vision or uh, which has been shown to you um, if you go into in the lower time spheres often you will find other spirits in the astral who are willing to, to, in a way, talk with you in your time, uh, in a way to, trans to swap thoughts at the speed of your biological brain. But if you go into higher spheres of consciousness, um, this is very uncommon. Uh, it's very usual for things just to, to show the essence of something, to transfer the essence, and in that way uh, transfer knowledge. Um, so it's also known of spiritual masters that they sometimes by a touch or by just looking at the person they very directly transfer knowledge and or speak to a person and the uh, person's um, consciousness or knowledge or uh, talent or skills are altered in an instant and in the same way as these spiritual masters work on, on humans uh, by in a way instantaneous communication and transformation this is also very useful in the higher spheres of consciousness and uh, with higher spheres I would mean the, the formless spheres um, because even the, the gods are more or less on the edge like they're willing to work with, with linear time 
but it can also work with non-linear time. But if you're working with planetary spirits directly and powers directly and um, uh, the spirits of, uh, of saints, angels, um, uh, higher beings, then usually there is instant transferal. But that instant transferal has to be yeah, translated into something linear and then time enters into the picture. Um, so how does this impact our spiritual development? Um, in general I find that um, the big trick is to be ready enough to, uh, to absorb knowledge in a good way. Because my own experience is of the knowledge I, uh, I receive, um, a large percentage is actually lost. Uh, because I am in too impure a state or too troubled a state or my life force is too weak. So most of the message, like 80% of the information which is given to me, is lost because I cannot integrate it, I cannot comprehend it, it's too much, it's too fast, it's too overwhelming. Um, so generally there is a, a big bottleneck uh, in the quality of the receiver, not so much in the, in the quality of the sender if you're uh, going into different spheres. Um, I've talked already about other processes which can help. Um, so keeping your energy as flexible as possible by eating um, uh, food which increases or enhances your emotional flexibility. So preferably fruit, if not fruit then seeds, if not seeds then uh, plants. And if you have to eat something animal uh, use dairy products um, and yeah if you have to consume uh, meat, uh, fish, uh, poultry and then uh, uh, mammals. Um, also the amount of sleep, the amount of rest you had, uh, the clarity of your consciousness, uh, how free you are from thought patterns, from emotional patterns and just in general blockages and all traumas which also consume and block and crystallize all your energies. So uh, a pure body uh, is generally uh, much more receptive to, uh, to the messages. And you may think like, gosh, but Hanko told me like 80% of the message is lost. Well, it used to be more like 95%. So I've made some progress, but uh, still I, yeah, I lose a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge. Uh, because yeah, my energy body is not up to the task of, uh, of really absorbing and integrating it well enough in my um, current state of consciousness as an incarnated being. Um, so um, the next question is do you make contact with different spheres during different phases of your sleep? And are there specific spheres which are easier to contact in a certain phase? Um, well, that is very, very dependent, I have to say. Um, it is just like the, with the normal consciousness. In general, the lowest vibration determines uh, where you end up in your sleep. Uh, but there is the exception that if there is a crisis, people can, in a way, uh, skip to higher vibrations to look for solutions or look to look for help or for answers, to bring a higher impulse or a higher light into um, a lower sphere of consciousness to, to transform it or to guide your way through it. Um, in general it is uh, actually a, a, yeah, a process of, of just churning through things. So the lowest level of sleep is actually that we are reprocessing the memories and the impressions of the day. So we're not actually going into other spheres, we are just um, working with all the impressions our body has had. And um, this also uh, happens when you're sick or when you've done a lot of sports. Um, a lot of the life force uh, is in a way also contained in the body, so you get an optimal um, uh, absorption and transformation of the impressions and also an optimal healing. Uh, what does happen though is that a lot of the, the patterns which are part of your body structure, so ancestral memories, uh, traumas and other things, 
will also show themselves very clearly especially when you're sick then all the life force becomes activated because you want to use everything which is available and also the things which are stuck in you uh, so all your habits all your subconscious patterns they will be activated because they want you are in a way trying to free up the energy which is frozen into that pattern so usually uh, the sleep especially during uh, during illness can be very healing or very transformative um, the next higher sphere we go into is the sphere of imagination um, so this is basically where um, you are confronting yourself with your own subconsciousness. Um, often these uh, dreams are highly symbolic. So every uh, person or creature or structure you see in your dream is basically just a mirror image of another part of your own self, of your own being. So if for instance I see a woman in my dream, it's probably my own feminine side. If I see a man in the dream, it's probably part of my own masculine side. Um, and um, often these dreams are uh, there to uh, bring your subconscious knowledge uh, forward. So if, like for instance, one part of my being is not very happy or not very balanced, uh, that part will present itself in the dream and will act out a, a bit of theater uh, to... Uh, to reveal itself. Um, so these dreams are also very uh, very healing uh, but not actually spiritual per se. Um, in slightly higher dreams you start to go into a collective consciousness and here it becomes possible to make contact with other dreamers um, but also with your, your own spirit guides or with uh, an egregore for instance. And these dreams have, in a way, um, a kind of reality to them. So things which happen in the first two types of dreams, they're just, you're playing with yourself. Um, but here, actually, transformations can take place. So you can wake up different uh, from how you went to sleep. You can be more tired or more energized or more stupid or more wise, depending on your, uh, your choices. It is, in a way, a double life which you're leading. And um, just like a person who has multiple personality disorder, you have kind of a, a dream self and a, a, an awake self. And there can be also a difference in personality. So you might notice that your dream self does certain things which, where you would think like, well, I would never do those things. I'm not like that. I'm much more brave or much more cowardly or much more honest or whatever. And yeah, your dream self yeah, has a different nature. Um, this is always a very interesting indication of the, the growth and transformation process. Um, because the difference which exists between your incarnated self and your uh, dream self is basically also showing a little bit of how you're trying to um, alter your, your dream self. Um, because slowly but surely your incarnated self will imprint itself upon your spirit. And if you're more honest in real life than you're in your dream, well, that's a good thing. Then you're turning your spirit into a more honest spirit. But if you find out that in your dream you're more honest than you are in real life, then actually you're in a way degrading your spirit. Um, so these uh, uh, dreams are often a little bit troubling because you might think like, why did I do that? Or why am I so strange? Or... Um, and uh, there's often a, a little bit also a feeling of a, of a loss of control because it is not your conscious self it's in a way an alter ego which is doing it um, as I said just like with multiple personality disorder there's just two different distinct personalities living in one body there is some overflow some overlap but they don't really know of each other they have a separate personality separate habits, uh, separate experiences. Um, and just like in your real life you can make friends and enemies, also in your dream life you can make friends and enemies, you can 
be become friends or enemies with different gods or angels or other spirits or um, countless of other beings. And um, this also makes the, the, the wake awakening very interesting. Uh, because if you have been interacting with those other spirits in your dream, then often at the moment you wake up, they will still be close to your physical body, because they're still interacting with you and helping you often also to bring the energies you picked up in the dream to integrate them into your physical self, into your day-to-day yeah, -day incarnated consciousness. Uh, so just after you wake up, if you look around you in the energetic sphere, you can see your friends in the in the in the higher worlds around you. So the quality of the place where you sleep is also very important um, because depending on the energies are there, which are there, or how uh, comfortable you are, uh, you're able to go into a higher state of awareness, a higher state of energy, and thus able to uh, to relate to them more easily. Um, it can also be a little bit troubling because if you sleep in a place where there have been a lot of impressions like a hotel or a place where there has been a spiritual workshop where there's lots of spirits all doing their own thing you can get caught up in these events caught up in their stream of things and then you end up with dreams which are not so much saying anything about you but rather about your environment um, so dreams are also often also in a way um, reflections of your uh, of your energetic habitat at the, at the moment of, of sleep um, because during the dream a uh, large part of your your energy goes to a higher sphere to another dimension and that also makes the the physical body and the incarnated consciousness more uh, receptive more susceptible so in a way during your sleep you're also vulnerable um, for picking up uh, lower energies uh, which are in the place where you are sleeping. So the person you are sleeping with, um, just like the, the energy in your in your bedroom, is very uh, very important also for the health of the body and um, uh, because the body is very open and it can interchange energies very very easily in such a state. Um, the good side is also you can uh, pick up certain talents or qualities of the person you're sleeping with. Also if you're sleeping with an animal you can pick up certain talents and qualities of that animal and the animal can do the same with you. Um, so there's really a kind of an assimilation process going on. Um, a, d a diffusion of energies during the, during the sleep and this also happens when you're awake but more rapidly during sleep or also during relaxation or meditation for that matter. So um, what you generally find uh, as when in regard to phases of sleep um, is that the um, is that the spirit tends to start to resolve uh, the lower energies uh, and work uh, and as the lower energies get dissolved then uh, the person goes into higher spheres so often uh, during the end of the sleep uh, persons tend to end up in slightly higher dimensions than at the beginning of the sleep this is not always true of course but um, it is often true um, what is also important to note is that the body also has rhythms and uh, during different uh, times of the day uh, different organs are active and therefore your consciousness is in a different process and when you sleep then that type of energy you're in will also attract a similar type of energy um, and from uh, from the cosmos so the time in the time of day compared well which is basically saying something about where your own uh, rhythm is in life force um, and also the astrological uh, weather uh, will determine very strongly in what sphere you will make contact with during your, your sleep and also the quality of the sleep and how it will transform you so uh, you will find that at a certain time of 
night you will go into a certain sphere and um, uh, so changing your sleep pattern uh, will have a very strong effect on, on your spiritual development and on the type of dreams uh, and experiences you will have during your sleep. Okay, so these were the questions which were left over. So are there um, questions or comments about these uh, questions or uh, should we move to a new topic? Now I, I don't have questions about what you just said. I think it's, just, it's good like that. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, you also wanted to talk about your topic about the um, experience and desires of in being incarnated. Um, do you have a, something very specific or just in general? Mm, maybe I could start with uh, explaining what happened last week to me and that will... M maybe... yeah, I just start with that. So, uh, last week I mentioned that I, I tried out to eat more cooked food. You, maybe you remember that and to experiment with that. And yeah, it could be that I have a little bit overdone it because the first two days I feel good and then I was really pushed into lower vibrations. So I couldn't feel my upper chakras anymore that good and I, was, I had some blockages in the second chakra and I was feeling very heavy, I couldn't move, I couldn't get up. I mean, yeah, I, I got you, really I got depressed. So <laughs> That was not nice, and um, I could realize that um, the whole topic of doing that in the first place is about incarnating more, so uh, coming more to Earth, and uh, yeah, that I got this impulse to to go more into that direction, and uh, so I started off, with, uh, yeah, trying to <laughs> lower myself. Yeah, then I realized that I got very unhappy with the fact that I can't feel my upper chakras very well. And that is the point where it all started off that, uh, yeah, that I became aware of how, how unhappy I am when I feel so much low vibration and I actually would like to be in a very different I, I, I went through all this questioning being human and, and I could, that I can't make peace with it being in a human body and uh, experiencing everything so and being so painful. And I went to see Ursula to, to, to maybe help me with that and I found out that uh, it's, it's like again making a decision to really accept that I am now incarnated in this human body and that I'm here on, on this earth and uh, yeah, in this session I could see that very, very, very far away from me there is a yes, something that says yes, it's okay, but in between right now what is present is that I'm very much against it, so I don't, I don't really want to be here, and, and I'm very, very unhappy with that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's like uh, I have a big fear that if I go more into these material and vibrations or this, yeah, going more into this life of being human and doing all the stuff humans do right now in <laughs> this time and I could lose any maybe the slightest connection that I have into into higher 
spheres are higher vibrations. And that makes me so unhappy, that is so painful for me, the thought that I could lose something, or, or that I have to let go of that in order to really be here. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if that is something you could Yes. yes, of course. Um, so I'll just uh, recap the question. Um, so the uh, experience um, of, um, in a way, forcing yourself into a lower vibration by yeah. uh, changing your food uh, created a lot of de depression, um, which was caused by the uh, lack of contact or lack of stimulation of the higher chakras yeah. so you uh, often this this feeling is, is almost feeling orphaned like you lose your connection to your your parental universe um, and become utterly material um, and this is in a way also the like the whole story of the, of the fall from grace the fall from from heavens uh, it, it's a very similar experience of leaving the higher vibration and being cast down into a, a lower vibration and often uh, by having such an experience also this um, fundamental pain or memory of the fundamental pain of the separation between you and God is also uh, reawakened uh, so it is it's often a double pain it is the, the pain of the spirit and the spiritual memory but also the, the pain which you are actually experiencing because of the separation which is happening at that uh, at that moment yeah. um, and here usually you, you get um, um, what what happens usually is, is that there is kind of a uh, a dead point which you can fly through uh, because as the vibration decreases the the spirit loses more and more of its abilities. It loses its, its consciousness, it loses its flexibility, uh, it loses its, uh, its knowledge, it loses its wisdom. Uh, so for the spirit to go into a lower vibration is never uh, a nice or a happy process. It is always uh, a process of, of sacrifice, even for like a, a saint or an angel or a spirit guide uh, to help us or to work with us. It's always a process of, uh, of separation. They always have to do something which they don't like just to be able to reach us or to make contact with us. Uh, so they often prefer to work with people who are able to meet them halfway than to have to work with people um, yeah, who can't even make it up a little bit up the, up the consciousness ladder. Um, but for humans it is usually compensated by um, the feelings of the ego. Um, because the ego is identified with, with the physical body, with the desires of the physical body, with the power of the, of the physical body. And uh, the ego, being a survival tool and identified with the physical body, tends to enjoy these lower, these heavier vibrations. Uh, it can feel its, its animal lust, its desire, its instinct. Uh, its desire for blood, for battle, for sex, for food and uh, this gives it focus, this gives it strength um, it gives the ego uh, a kind of a purpose, a goal uh, so often you see that when, while the spirit gets more and more demotivated and goes into depression the ego itself becomes stronger and more motivated the, the lower the vibration um, so the, the interesting question in this case is uh, why doesn't your ego wake up and enjoy itself uh, if you go into the lower vibrations? Or the other question might be uh, why is your consciousness linked only to your spirit and not to your ego? Um, that's another question you might ask yourself. Um, in general what you find is that um, people develop a certain strategy. Uh, most people rely on their ego to help them. Um, so they have uh, 
a technique basically like whenever there's a problem I will use violence, I will use force, I will use my emotions, I will use my body uh, to get whatever I want um, and this is basically a very animalistic uh, instinct and in most humans this is, this is also the dominant instinct uh, but some people have learned either because these animalistic powers did not work um, or for other reasons uh, to rely on their spirit even when there are problems when there is uh, a big problem so if like violence doesn't work, force doesn't work, emotional blackmail doesn't work, manipulation doesn't work, seduction doesn't work then you need a higher impulse to guide you, to help you to see your way out of a situation or just to take your consciousness out of a situation which is unbearable and then also the consciousness can take refuge in the spirit or in the spiritual world or spiritual dimensions and if this is so then basically the ego is uh, not used or not developed very much because it is, see, is seen as an uh, imperfect tool compared to the spirit um, and uh, if this is the case um, then like you usually like when people are in when their higher centers are very active the spirit is very joyful and the ego is usually fearful because it, it's associating that with death uh, if it's in your very low centers then the spirit is usually asleep or not doing anything or depressed and the ego is very joyful and very active and it's usually in the middle ground when neither the spirit is very active and joyful or the, nor the ego that people usually feel the depression um, but this is more on a, on a general level that people tend to find the dead zone where neither the, the, yeah, the ego or, nor the spirit is stimulating very much it's kind of like a comfortably numb uh, state which they're in um, well if they would take the effort to go either up or down they would be much more stimulated um, in your case uh, specifically um, I think your ego has kind of um, a wrong tendency um, it does not really exalt or enjoy these lower vibrations um, because it has uh, taught itself in a way um, yeah I, I think I talked earlier a little bit about learned helplessness that um, uh, what it does or tries to do will not have the right result or the right effect so it is in a way a little bit fearful or hesitant to uh, use its own power, to go into its own power. Uh, it's basically by feeling your own power that you usually get this power rush, like this power mad dictator or uh, crazy scientist or uh, uh, for instance a, a rapist or a bully. Um, those sensations of power, those thrills of power and power abuse often, um, they're very typical of the ego and these are usually also what is the, the pleasurable sensation of going into these lower senses um, but also if you have a very strong sense of, uh, of duty or morality or justice then also people tend not to allow their ego to really indulge itself into either the fantasies or the actual behavior of, uh, of manifesting this power um, because you don't want to be a tyrant, you don't want to be a bully, you don't want to be overly intimidating and usually these uh, restrictions also dull the, the sensation and I do think that um, uh, you personally uh, are blocking a lot of these uh, powers of the, of the ego um, and this is in a way uh, causing the ego not to pick up with joy and thrill uh, uh, compared to the, to the spirit losing it um, and ultimately this is uh, due to a process of transformation uh, the spirit has to transform the ego to shape the ego into a, a good caretaker uh, who can protect the body, who can protect the fortress 
um, but also doesn't get in the way of what the spirit wants or doesn't get in the way of what is right. And um, depending on the, uh, the state of the consciousness or the state of the energy body, um, you need either uh, like a utopic art or very dark art in a way to um, to change the consciousness or to change the, the, the structure of the ego. Um, so in a way, um, if the, 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 the energy body um, is stuck in a very uh, dark place, so there's too much pain, too much sadness, too much anger, uh, too much of these emotions, um, then you need something like romance, like comedy, like humor, uh, beauty. Um, uh, you need those types of higher impulses to transform the self uh, so that it will not be so gloomy anymore. Um, contrary, um, if the uh, person is in this state of, in a way, uh, almost um, uh, innocence and ignorance and purity, um, then uh, you need uh, certain art to, uh, to thrill it into action. So you need um, a kind of uh, violence, uh, competition, uh, uh, death, disease, uh, drama, um, um, to yeah, kind of invigorate it. Um, and um, you can have it, of course, in real experiences. But these real experiences are very hard to digest and if you take it in in the form of art then it is just like food it's of a higher vibration it tries to make your energy body more flexible so in a way if you have the choice between getting beaten up physically or listening to some dramatic Tchaikovsky or uh, seeing a dramatic ballet uh, I would suggest you go towards this, uh, the art form, rather than the, than the physical vibration, which is a lot more yeah, rigid in energy. And this is also the purpose of, uh, in a way, the, the dark things which also are present in art. Uh, because a lot of operas and ballets are also about death and betrayal and uh, things like this. Because we also need that. Uh, that drama sometimes. Um, and um, this drama is, is, is meant to be to be gripping, mm -hmm. but also it is meant to uh, to stimulate uh, very much the lower emotional centers. While this art which is purely beautiful and harmonic is meant to stimulate the higher emotional the higher uh, centers. Um, so rather than just using uh, food to, to get into the lower centers, which might be a little bit too much or a little bit too heavy because then you can get stuck in it. It might be better to ease up on the food a little bit and try to focus a little bit on this, this darker, heavier art to help you to ground yourself. Um, so some people like to see uh, maybe war movies or things like that. Um, Sorry, some people like to see what? Uh, war movies or um, horror movies. Horror movies, other uh, uh, or movies about war or about other conflict. Um, so oh. it is kind of of a second-hand way of still bringing in these lower vibrations, these uh, lower emotions. Um, so that might be easier to digest than, uh, than going directly into it. Uh, also, like for instance in, in my personal life, uh, I spent some time in banks and insurance companies and government offices. Um, so this was also too much of a low energy and I, it was very unhealthy for me. I got really stuck. Um, my mind also became a very selfish mind, a very aggressive mind. Um, so I noticed that even though it was nourishing my, uh, my ego uh, and making my ego more predominant, 
compared to the influences from my spirit. Um, I was, it was also um, pushing me into patterns which were not in accordance to my spirit. And if, for instance, I see a horror movie, then like still these lower energies, or if I sit in a roller coaster, also this fear, this thrill, this adrenaline is created. But it is not so heavy, it's not such a solid structure that my spirit can't shape it anymore. So it's uh, important also to, uh, to have a good dosage and to also to have these en heavier energies to be flexible enough and not to stuck into predetermined patterns or forcing you into predetermined patterns. Um, also by going back into, um, into these lower vibrations, all the old pains and traumas which are still there also can be reactivated uh, if this is done uh, too much or too quickly. Um, the problem is also that um, if, the, if the spiritual consciousness remains, then it tends to criticize very much the, uh, the joys of the, of the ego. Uh, because like your ego might be very happy if it's eating some ice cream or uh, if it's making promotion or you're making love or you're seducing somebody, uh, because these are all very important thrills for, for the ego, but the spirit has been through that millions of times and had yeah, thousands of incarnations and it's like, well, so what if I'm eating or drinking or having sex? It doesn't mean anything. It, it's, I've done it countless of times. But for the ego, which is very stuck in one lifetime, and even more within that lifetime, he's very stuck on that specific moment. It can think ahead maybe a few hours or a few days, but it's very focused, it's, it's, it has a very limited uh, horizon. Uh, and things are therefore a lot larger. Uh, the same thing when you're young. Uh, things are also a lot larger because you've never had such a great uh, trip before, or such a great emotion before, or such nice food before. So the things tend to be uh, a lot bigger because of lack of experience. And your spirit is, yeah, by nature a little bit jaded, and uh, by its jadedness, it can also decrease and give a negative comment on the experiences of the of the ego. And ultimately, this can be very detrimental for the ego and the development of the ego if your spirit is constantly decreasing its power. And I've had that experience a lot myself. Um, because my ego was insufficient when I was young myself. Um, so I had to rely on my spirit and my spirit felt that it had to remain in control because the ego could not handle it and it uh, really started to, um, to negatively comment on all the qualities of the ego to maintain its control, uh, which is also not good because the ego is there in a way uh, to be a caretaker, so the spirit can do its own thing. Um, can sometimes even leave and go travel in other dimensions, while the ego is just taking care of eating, sleeping, um, working even. Uh, it's only when we do work which is interesting to the spirit, or which is creative or transformative, that the spirit actually has to be involved. But with routine work, uh, yeah, you can just coast on on your ego, and your spirit also doesn't have to suffer the dreary repetition. Um, so they can work very well together, but the spirit has to also allow it. It has to have enough faith and trust uh, in the ego. And I think also in your specific case, uh, there's an issue there, because you've seen and you've witnessed many egos which are completely out of control uh, and also completely in control over the person's life. So the person is in a way, um, the spirit is being is a hostage of a madman, uh, you could say, because the ego is just insane and the spirit is unable to escape it and unable to get back control. And I think these things you have seen in your life are uh, also reinforcing um, in a way, the allergy of your of your spirit uh, towards uh, giving over control, really 
uh, to the ego and in a way when the power of the spirit decreases but the power of the ego doesn't increase you get into a state of utter powerlessness and passivity uh, because your spirit is not interested in these lower centers it's not interested in uh, in your career or your wealth or whatever and if your spirit if your ego doesn't wake up to take over there is no interest there is no desire and then you go into depression um, so you should not in a way go down or deactivate your spirit if your ego is not picking up the pace okay okay do you think that will work Yeah, it, it makes it, it was a lot you, you explained right now, and I was trying to, to think along with that. And um, so it's generally you, you would say that the direction I'm heading to is right, so to go more into lower vibration and to kind of stimulate the ego or kind of like waking it up yes yeah but it has to be done slower and i think also more gently um, oh. so um, for instance because one of the things um, i notice a little bit when you were talking about the food is also that um, the quality of the food has also gone down um, yeah. Because when you were started making cooked food, you made really nice food. And yeah, I think you got into a negative spiral because when your energy is not so good, then the food is not so good, and because the food is not so good, your energy is not so good. Yeah, so it's that's, important. That's I'm going along for all of my life right now, and, and I, I'd rather like to eat nothing anymore, so that would be the best solution for me. But yes. I have yeah, but you have to, in a way, then try to, to, to get into a more positive spiral of really making the effort to, to make, uh, to eat really nice food and to, to really enjoy the smells and the taste of your little culinary experiments. And in that way also, um, you can have a low vibration without making it too low. And if you notice that, gosh, I'm not making food in the right way then it might be better to eat uh, eat out or have somebody else make food for you or um, or something like that <laughs> or then eat uh, uh, in, again pure food just eat a raw carrot which is energy will be okay because um, if you eat raw food that the food tends to have its own energy uh, which is dependent just on the life of, of the being which you're consuming and if you're cooking, you're in a way transforming the energy, so your own energy becomes a lot more important and a lot bigger of a factor um, in how the energy of the food will, will turn out to be. So if your own energy is bad, you should just eat an apple or eat some fruit. If your own energy is good, then you should cook for yourself, I think. Okay, yeah. So more... Heading in the in the in this direction, but more gently, and yeah, maybe. But it seems that I don't really understand this this top. Yes, it's, it's it's the relation with my spirit is so important to me, and and I don't want to lose that. Yes. And then. Yeah, I think the important thing is in a way to, to get your spirit to build up its double, to, to build up its ego. Uh, because right now you're in a way falling into, into an abyss. Because there's nothing there to catch you. There's no other you on the other side. And yeah. I think you slowly have to build up this other you. <laughs> but yeah, it hasn't... It doesn't have a very solid or a very healthy foundation and that makes it very hard to uh, to get that going but what, what, yeah this 
because in, in general people build up their egos uh, in their youth and it is mainly built up also by their parents who are in a way uh, telling their children uh, to, to teaching their children to, to fight for themselves to manipulate how to how to get ahead in life and um, this is generally how the ego is uh, is created uh, so the and if the parental influence is not sufficient or not healthy then the ego also tends to uh, yeah to turn out a lot weaker or deformed and I think with both our, our lives this is uh, very much the case um, that our ego is, is in a way malformed um, and um, The, the, the more deformed the ego is, the more the, the feeling you, you is that you get that you are in a way losing yourself instead of going into a different part of yourself. Yeah, I, that's, that's, the, that's the point. I don't uh, see that as part of myself. Hmm. That's, the, <laughs> that's, not, that's not me, that's the answer. To, to, to that and I can't identify with yes, it, it, it. It's a very tricky thing because it's actually one of the first things my teacher told me that I should learn to identify <laughs> and for me like I, I, my, like my lowest identification I could make is I'm a human I could not, I, I could not even identify with myself as a man because that was too specific. <laughs> Let alone as a man of a certain age or uh, with certain traits. <laughs> I really saw myself, I experienced myself as a spirit. And um, my teacher basically said, it is like, uh, if you remain like this, you will be unable to communicate with, with the people around you. Uh, because they just live in, in a completely different reality. They think that they're a baker or a butcher or a mechanic or a secretary or something like this. And this is what they think they are. <laughs> and uh, they live in, an, in a complete illusion, of course. Um, but for you, their world is invisible <laughs> because you cannot experience it. It is something vague you might have heard of but if you cannot experience it you, you cannot really relate you cannot be on the same energetic level you cannot connect to these people uh, you can only connect to their their spirit and this was also true the people were like big blurs to me and I could see the potential and power in the spirit but I would be utterly be utterly amazed at what they would do and why and uh, so step by step I uh, started to teach myself all the cardinal sins um, to uh, lower my vibration and to get some understanding of the working of their egos. So what is this whole envy thing? What is this jealousy? What is greed? Um, I've never had those experiences because they're not part of the structure of my, my spirit. Um, so I had to build them up in my ego. Uh, this is what the ego is also useful for. Um, because all kinds of vibrations you don't have or don't want to have in your spirit, you can build up in your ego and when you die, they die. So this way, this envy, this greed, this jealousy, I don't have to take it with me into my next incarnation, but during this incarnation it helps me to function, to understand why people are doing what they are doing. To see a little bit the, the dark side or the heavier vibrations in, the, in this cosmos. But how do you make sure that what you build up in this lifetime doesn't imprint on your spirit? Yes, so, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's never completely safe, it's also never completely pure, so it does imprint. Uh, that's yeah, in a way the, the sacrifice I told. Uh, for any spirit who decides to, to come from a higher level of awareness to a lower level of awareness. Uh, it's like swimming around in a sewer. And you hope that you're healthy enough so you don't catch any nasty diseases when you get out of the sewer and you can wash yourself off again. 
but there's always a risk. And it's in a way what the, what the, your spirit is doing by incarnating. It takes a swim in the sewers. Because it is a lower vibration full of dirt and full of pollution. And um, the spirit has to remain healthy enough to, to be able to deal with it. But also the ego is kind of like a protective suit you can wear while in the sewer. So it, it buffers you. So instead of the spirit being uh, exposed directly to other people's greed or envy or anger or whatever these uh, yeah, sins or emotions are, then uh, these are picked up by your ego and dealt with by your ego. So your spirit stays out of the process. It doesn't have to deal with all those kind of things. So in a way you, um, you can train your ego to become a filter. To, uh, so you can interact with these energies, but also they can be transformed and filtered out again, so your spirit doesn't have to get involved with them too much. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's an ideal case, but it is a risky process, so there's no denying it. Okay. Um, but you know, it's, it's a bit confusing though, because all the time, in, 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 in whenever you learn something about spiritual development and so on and so on, you, you, you're even in class when I do with when I'm with my yoga students I tell them about their ego and how she, how they should try to somehow let that aside for a moment and experience something else or overcome that and, and mm -hmm. that's that's the whole process they are doing right here so for, is it that for some people it's more like okay get rid of your ego and for some it's like, okay, try to build up an ego, is it like that? Yes, it's, it's, it's indeed very different depending on the, on the person. Um, so the, I spoke earlier, I think, also about the Femina Rubra and Virgo Alba, the Red Lady and the, the White Virgin. Yeah. Um, so some people are in a process of purification, of trying to get into a higher vibration, and then you should get out of your ego, your consciousness should be transferred to your spirit. But people who are in the, in the red lady phase, so they, uh, they're in a phase where they're, from a spiritual perspective, they desire power uh, to manifest themselves. And if you're in this femina rubra, the red lady phase, then uh, you should build up an ego to act as your tool, as your, your, your storage of of earthly power, of material power, um, so that you can just wield it uh, like a tool or like a sword to, to um, so for instance like you might want to build a spiritual center and you just tell your ego like okay go and find me money and it will lie, it will manipulate, it will uh, uh, search and look or work and gather all the money for the spiritual center. <laughs> um, so the, the powers of the ego are not uh, per se negative, um, but they are material. And okay, as we also have learned, uh, uh, if you try to solve things by power, you very easily and very quickly go into the dark side of the cosmos. While, while you work on purity, you go into the light side of the cosmos. So building up an ego is a very tricky thing. Because you are, in a way, building up a tool which is much more uh, in tune with the dark side of the cosmos. So also your connection to the dark side of the cosmos will increase as the power of your ego increases. And so also the influence the dark side of the cosmos will have on you will also increase. But ultimately, if, yeah, if you don't build up a tool, you're, you end up being powerless. Yeah, that's what I can, I can see. Uh, and that's and that is that is the impulse that that makes me try go go for that. So I can I can see that for myself. And um, it is also that on a very um, literal stage, I'm I'm starting off for a job by the end of of March, and uh, 
it's kind of like, I feel like, okay, I have to kind of prepare myself for that going out there and putting on armor because I, I can't can't go there right in the, in the way I feel right now. Or, or, mm -hmm. You understand? That's, that yes. is what what is behind it on the practical level in my day-to-day -day life that I have to kind of dive into this whole material world now and to act in that and to yeah find a way to manifest so that that is what i can what i can clearly see but with my question another question is is who or what can can guide me in that so if i can't use my 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 own spirit right now because it wants it, it, it rejects the idea of building up ego. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what else could I could I go for? Have you studied Homer Simpson yet? I I have to admit, not uh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think he he's really the uh, the prime example of a person who is like completely in his ego. Uh, he's completely in the moment, he's also completely selfish, he's willing to, to lie, to cheat, to do whatever for his own gratification, uh, but yet he is not evil. <laughs> so I think he's, uh, he's a very good example and I really think, uh, yeah, you should study him. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> This time I really should do that. Yeah. yeah. And because it, it, it's like an animal, there's there's a kind of an innocence to it. Uh, because an animal is also often just selfish and driven by instinct, but it's also in a way innocent. It's pure. And this is how a good ego should be. Uh, it should have an innocence. It should have a purity. And this makes what an ego, uh, this is what keeps an ego light, or on the light side of the cosmos. If it becomes too trapped into in all kinds of manipulations or attachments um, and patterns, then it's very easily slides into the dark side. Would you say that um, if I, for instance, if I had this uh, uh, um, a goal that I could uh, could consider being something, yeah, pure or good or, or light. That that I could structure my ego towards meeting that goal. Yes, of course. Yes. So so that I could maybe adjust more on that. So not because that is the, the I I talked to Ursula about that. That that is the the. A great fear that I could get sidetracked somehow. Yeah, because the ego is, is, is basically meant to deal with all the um, uh, the capital, the, ca the cardinal sins. Um, because the cardinal <laughs> sins are called cardinal sins because they basically usually give power um, to the incarnated self uh, over the uh, over the spiritual self. So if you go into anger, greed, sloth, um, envy, jealousy, pride, uh, then the, the ego becomes dominant over the spirit. Um, so a, a good ego is able to, uh, to work with all those energies, to, to draw power from them, uh, because every sin gives power to the ego uh, without going too far without uh, allowing them to, to override the, uh, the spirit. So for instance uh, you can be prideful but if your pride is so strong you do not listen to your spirit or if your anger is so strong you do not listen to your spirit then your ego is, is not doing it correctly. So your ego should get power and strength from all these emotions and attachments and identifications but not too much. Um, so, uh, in a way, you should strive for power, but also not to be too greedy, for, to try to get too much power, because then these sins will get too strong, too dominant in you. And uh, depending on the nature of your spirit, 
uh, you will be more uh, able to develop certain sins than others. Um, but often also the, the power which is strong in, uh, in your spirit still is also the power which is often least transformed because it hasn't been filtered out of your spirit yet. So this is often the, the greatest risk. For instance, if your spirit is still filled with anger and hatred and uh, things like this, then uh, this will easily build up in the ego, but it will also very quickly become too much. Uh, so yeah. it is safer to, to work with the powers in which you are weak. So for instance, envy uh, is, is, is a weak power in you. And yeah, you can try to be as envious as possible and to... to uh, what, what, what is envy again? Um, why does this person have the job instead of me? Why does he make oh. more money than me? Uh, why yeah, does he get a compliment and not me? Uh, yes, that is envy. <laughs> As I said, it, it's something which is relatively weak in your spirit. <laughs> but it is a very strong motivation for people. <laughs> it's a very strong motivation. Yeah, many people do that. They want to have status. They want to make promotion to, to get a better job than their neighbor or a better job than their colleague. Uh, uh, make more money than their colleague. They, it's uh, inherent competition. Uh, and competition itself can be positive and Envy is very much part mm -hmm. of the competition, but envy is also about not, in a way, um, allowing or granting it graciously to the other person, but feeling like I should have it, not the other one. This is the feeling of envy. Okay. So, and this was for me one of the very tricky ones. It took me about a year and a half to develop it. So it's not, not easy, but it can be done. Uh, I took Mr. Burns, also from The Simpsons, as an example. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, uh, yeah, when I started out with, with this whole spiritual development stuff, I couldn't think of learning this. <laughs> you, you're kind of advising me now to sin, do you? <laughs> Um, well, to develop them, yes, <laughs> indeed, um, because it, your ego is, is made up out of attachments um, with very temporarily, uh, temporary and worldly things. And these sins are basically the essence of the attachment to temporary and worldly things. They are the, the, the epitome of illusion. And if you have no illusions, you have no ego. Because you just recognize everything is, is transient. <laughs> there is no attachment, but also there will be no ego. And it is possible, by the way, to, to work uh, with the spirit without ego. So it is not an impossibility, but it is another path and more difficult. Um, because instead of building up the ego, the spirit can also learn how to work directly with these heavier earthly energies. And um, the problem is that the spirit has to consciously work with these heavier earthly energies, which it doesn't like to do. So there's a really a lot of resistance, inner resistance in the spirit, which has to be conquered. So instead of like putting on your diving suit or getting your, your submarine before going into the sewer, you have to get naked and dive into the sewer. And uh, a large part of it is, is basically the, the, uh, uh, the vow uh, which is taken in uh, 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 Mahayana Buddhism uh, that you uh, will keep on incarnating until all living beings have been, become enlightened. So this is often a vow which is strong enough to force your spirit or to make your spirit to do things on a lower level, even without an ego. But for most people, the resistance of the ego, just the loathing and the yuck, which the ego feels at having to deal with these lower energies is too much. But it is possible, of course, to motivate and to, to 
to discipline your ego to to do it without uh, uh, to discipline your spirit to do it without building up an ego and ultimately that is better because then yeah uh, but it's also heavier and riskier for the spirit because it has to deal directly with all these heavy energies uh, which will impact on it directly you won't have the buffering or the luxury of running away when things get too difficult and leaving it to the ego. Yeah, like, uh, I think the, the path I'm on right now is, is the one that is right. So it, it kind of comes naturally. So and, and I take that for a sign that that is the way you should or I should go or and everything else is, is something else. Wow. Okay, well we've been talking for nearly an hour and a half, so... Yeah, thank you very much yeah. for, for going into that. And oh, I, think uh, it's, I think it's a great so topic for everybody. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I don't know if you have time and we'll take the trouble maybe some some time later by the end of the month or something to to get back on that and, and we could talk about it how i could how i went along would that be possible? sure sure um, I mean, it's also, the end of march end of march I'm yeah i'm also planning to come over to germany again in the oh, end yeah. of march so molina invited us so um, yeah. We still so, have yeah. to plan a little bit, but yeah, I'm yeah. a little bit late actually with planning. I should have done that months ago, yeah. but well, okay, there you have it. <laughs> so that means you you're coming for the uh, for um, for uh, the the twenty first. Uh, yes, the equinox. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh great. Yeah, maybe we could all meet then at, at Molina's place. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm going to have a session with her on, on 13. 